Okay, thanks everyone. Um, so this is a continuation for the last um, week uh, lecture or session about the evident introduction to evidence-based medicine and a little bit introduction to intervention study randomized controlled trials and systematic uh, reviews. Today, what we are trying to do that we will critically appraise and critically read um, a randomized controlled trial and intervention study. So let's start with this um, case scenario. You have been in a clinic and um, you have been presented with um, uh, a mother with her uh, kid, a few weeks kid coming to the immunization. And um, she was asking you whether she, um, the, the first time that um, her baby got the immunization, he was in severe pain and there was a lot of reaction, redness and swelling um, in his arm. And uh, she thought that if there's any change in the needle size could reduce that reaction, local reaction. So as you have been trained in evidence-based medicine, you looked up uh, and you try to find what's the best available evidence to answer that question. So the first question, what do you think? Is that um, a diagnostic question? Is that a prognostic question? Is that um, a prevalence, treatment? What kind of a question that she is asking you about? So it could be prognostic side effect or it could be treatment. If that needle size, like for example, if a smaller needle could be having less um, reaction. So therapy could be, but prognostic could be included because usually the prognosis is um, resulted, uh, is a result of the intervention. Yeah, so it's a mix between an intervention and prognosis, but mostly an intervention. And for an intervention study, which type of primary study that uh, provide you with the highest quality of evidence? An RCT, yeah, RCT, exactly. I will be looking at an RCT, and I'm sure that you are all familiar with that, um, the uh, this different study design, experimental intervention study design, or observational study design. Um, and um, this randomized control trial, or only a control trial, non-randomized control trial, and then the observation of whether that's a descriptive study or analytic study, and then the cohort case control cross-section. I think that's very important uh, for you to know. And um, uh, please, if you have any question in this uh, type of study design, I think it's time, um, please feel free to ask. So today, our main uh, focus will be about the experimental study and mostly about the randomized control trials. And in the randomized control trial, usually what's happened that uh, the researcher um, assessed a group of population according to the eligibility criteria that they said before. And whoever eligible to be enrolled in the study, usually it randomized to two or more than intervention. And those will be allocated to the assigned intervention. For example, a group will be randomized to the uh, treatment group and the other will be randomized to the control group. And they will be followed up for a period of time and then the outcome will be measured. And sometimes the outcome measured periodically, for example, four or five times over two years. And then the analysis will happen after finishing the follow-up period. So you um, looked up the evidence and you found this article that has been published in the BMG. And in this article um, that has been distributed um, to you, sorry, apology for that, that has been distributed in enough time, like for example, one week ago, so that you can read it, but it's only like few pages and has been uh, selected uh, purposefully so that um, we can somehow skim read it while we are doing the uh, session. So the conclusion of this article that has been published in the BMJ that the use of this 25 millimeter needles significantly reduced the rate of local reactions to routine, to routine infant immunization. So based on this um, study that has been published in a, a high impact journal, will you trust the author's conclusion? That's 100 percent, yeah. Depend on the methods you will, yeah. Check the methods, yeah, great. 
Yeah, exactly. So even if it has been published in, in, in a very or high impact journal, that doesn't mean that we should blindly trust whatever the conclusion that has been made in that article. We should um, critically appraise the article um, especially the methods and make sure that the methods has been um, or the RST or the article or the research study has been conducted in high quality standards that enable us to uh, believe the results and the conclusions. Okay, if we look at the article, what do you think is the population that has been included in this study? I'm not sure if you are familiar with uh, with the mnemonics called PICO or PICOS or the P for population, the I for intervention, uh, the C for the comparison, and the O for the outcome. Yeah, infants. So the population, infants, and this information of the PICO. Yeah, infants. This information of the PICO. Usually, you should be able to um, extract it or have it from the title sometimes from the title, sometimes from the abstract. But if you couldn't find this information from in the title and the abstract, you could go and look. Usually it should be somewhere in the last paragraph of the introduction, just before the methods. So for the, the peak of for the population intervention um, comparison outcome, you can find it either in the title abstract or sometimes in the last paragraph um, of the introduction there where you should find uh, the research question. So for the population, usually healthy infant in their four month or in the, their third immunization um, in the UK. And what's the intervention and comparison in this um, article or in this study? Is it the immunization, for example? Yeah, the size of the needle. Yeah, the lungs for short needles. So yeah, they are comparing two kind of needles. Uh, the first one, 25G, uh, and the second, 23G, which is the short and uh, long needles. Whatever intervention or comparison doesn't matter, but this is one of them intervention and the other comparison. And what about the outcome? What could be the outcome? Yep, the local reaction, reaction. Yet, yeah, so for the outcome, we are more interested in the, what's the actu actual outcome that they are measuring rather than the results that they have found. So we are interested in something like local reaction, redness, swelling, these kind of things, rather than whether 25 um, G is better than 23 or whatever. So we are interested in what's the actual uh, outcome that they have measured. And uh, mentioning the time period is sometimes very critical and very important. So for example, if they have measured the outcome three hours after the uh, intervention, after the immunization, it's different, could be different than if they have measured that three days or one week after the immunization. So that's why sometimes they call it a PICOT, population intervention comparison outcome and then the timing. So then you will ask yourself, because usually you will have um, a patient and you'll think about, you, you'll, you'll have some kind of clinical question in your mind. You search the literature, you found an article, you will read just the title abstract. And by that, you will check if that article um, match somehow your original clinical question very based on your patient. If it's match and you find that it's worth the time 15 or 10 minutes to spend to read the full article, then you will check that and go to read the full article, especially the method section and critically appraise it. So the most important um, section to read, what do you think um, are the most important section to read in the full article or in the article? So which sections uh, you usually um, um, read in the article? Methods, yeah. Conclusion, conclusion abstract, methods, abstract, results, abstract, methods. Yeah, that's the usual abstract. That's the usual answer that uh, we get. So usually 
you'll start with the abstract and um, to check if that's some kind of an article that you would like to spend the 10, 15 minutes uh, of your time to read it in full. Um, if that's an article, then mostly I would recommend reading uh, the method section because in the introduction, usually they will talk about the immunization, the different needles, um, the reaction. That's suppose I would suppose that you will know a little bit about it and you are not that interested in. You're interested mostly in the method to check if that study has been conducted um, um, in high quality, that's you will trust the result or not. If the methods sounds like um, it has been done appropriately, you will go to check the results. Uh, for the conclusion and the discussion, usually uh, most of the spin going around, if there's any spin in the article, usually in the discussion and the conclusion. So I would propose that based on the methods and the results, you should draw your own conclusion. And sometimes you can check if that conclusion that you have drawn based on the methods and the results is uh, matching the author's conclusion or not. And to critically appraise um, an RCT or uh, an intervention studies, there is a mnemonic, RAMBO. Um, and that's um, stand for randomized, the R for randomized, whether that's randomized or not, the A for attrition, the M for measurement, and the BO for whether that's measurement blinded or the outcome objective or not. And we will come into details for each of these uh, elements. So RAMBO for um, critically appraising um, uh, an intervention study or randomized controlled trials. So let's start with, you could think of that as, um, as a race. To have a good study, you should have um, a good start. You should have a fair start. So all the participants of that run should, should have a fair go. That's the R, the randomized. And then uh, they should have um, a fair also attrition. So there's no uh, lots of dropouts in one arm of the study, one group compared to the other. And the authors and clinician has um, treated all the participants regardless of their allocation or regardless whether they have randomized to the intervention or the comparison equally. So that's the dropouts. And then finally, fair finish. The researcher has measured the outcome equally or fairly between all the participants regardless of the assigned intervention. So, these are the elements and we will come into uh, details with the first elements, the randomization, randomized. And in the randomization, you will ask yourself whether that's a fair start and was the assignment to the treatment or the intervention group probably, probably randomized or not? And for that, let's, let's ask our, ourselves why it's important to do a randomization. And that's one of the things that uh, I was proposing, uh, to, I was proposed, supposed to do in the last session, but we can do this a little bit of um, uh, group exercise together. So why it's important to, to do a randomization? To avoid bias, yeah, have reliable results, avoid the chance, or avoid confounding bias, that's a very good answer, yep allocation bias. Yeah, it's mostly about avoiding bias, but it's most importantly to avoid any confounding factors. And the problem with the known and most importantly, the unknown confounding factors. For the known confounding factors, you can group, you can do lots of other um, statistical or method, methodological um, um, approaches that you can deal with confounding factors, the non confounding factors. But what about the unknown confounding factors that you are not aware of? That's why randomizing uh, the, uh, the participant into the different groups can take care of that. And we will demonstrate that in this group exercise. So let's um, assume that uh, we have, so have you received this link? If you could go to that link, 
And this is, for example, um, a group of people that's awaiting as a line in one of the practices and you are conducting a study and you'd like to randomize those people into different and in, into two intervention. The treatment, for example, aspirin and the control placebo. And from your perspective, all of them like similar to each other. There's no differences. But the unknown confounding factor are those in the green are like a mild, have a mild um, cardiovascular risk score, but those on the um, yellow or uh, brown have a high cardiovascular risk score. And if those, if those unknown confounding factors have unequally allocated to the group, that can lead to, um, to bias in the results. So let's see if we will if we if we randomize the people using this flipping the coin uh, will we will flip the coin and if it came as a head we will take it to the treatment group and if it's um, in the tail uh, we will take it to the control group does that make sense so maybe we can start flipping the coin yourself and just uh, tell me whether that's a head or tail. And tell me, so head, so head, sorry, remind me, head, we say that that should be um, treatment, isn't it? I think so. Let's assume head, that means treatment. Next one. Oh yeah, it's coming. So head, tail. And, and so. uh, which the coin is it tail? So the head, oh, I'm, I'm taking the head to the intervention and the tail to the um, control. Tail, tail, okay, head, tail. No, oh, yeah, head, okay. So now what we did, oh, we, we have one. I think there's one tail, a few, okay, that's fine. So what we did is just mimic a symbol randomization just by flipping the coin. If we are in a practice, is um, what we did is like mimicking um, a very symbol randomization process by flipping the coin. And uh, we started with, um, I think they were 40. And let's count how many. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight of the green here, and one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. So eight green, 12 brown, so 20 overall. And here, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, oh, four, five, 12, 13 green, and seven, um, Brown. So the first thing that's you can, it's it's difficult to be done without randomization. That the forty participants that you start with have been randomly and equally distributed into two groups, twenty each. We haven't done anything. We haven't like forced them to be twenty in each group. Just by random luck, we have ended up with the twenty in each group. And if you can see this unknown confounding, that's green and brown, we don't know it. And just by luck, that we have somehow a very equal distribution. We have somehow very equal distribution of these uh, confounding factors. That's by very simple randomization process. That's just flipping the coin. And also with a very small limited sample size, just 40, usually the, the randomized trial with hundreds or thousands of people. And that will make it very equally distributed. And that's the beauty of randomization, that it can deal with all those known and unknown confounding factors. 
I have I have done this uh, exercise many times in the sessions, and it's usually end up with the same thing. Usually, it's either 2020, 1921, 1822, and with this um, unknown confounding factor, the brown and uh, green usually um, distributed somehow equally, something like that. So that's the beauty of randomization that it can deal with these known and unknown confounding factors. And exactly with the larger numbers, the randomization will be better and better. And also with um, a more proper randomization procedure like computer randomization, this will be done uh, more appropriately. So that's the importance of randomization. And we have to make sure that uh, there's a randomization, a fair start, and it, this randomization process has has been done like according to the good um, practice. So check the methods if the randomization has been done um, according to um, a good practice. Usually we are looking for a computer um, generated random sequence, uh, random sequence, which is um, using the computer to generate the randomization sequence. That's the computer. And usually that's what happen is, um, when a patient's coming to the um, to the clinic, for example, or to the hospital, and uh, a researcher or a clinician check the eligibility criteria, if the patient match or eligible to be included in the study, usually they call um, a central administrator, asking them uh, to generate that uh, sequence and enroll that patient to the study, and they give the clinician just a number, and that number centrally linked to the allocation intervention, allocated intervention. So there's a question, this supposedly equal number of healthy and unhealthy, what if the high risk were very few? We may get them all. We may get them all in one group. That's a possibility, especially if you have a very small sample size, but we did it with 40 and we end up with somehow equalizing um, them in the two group. And that's that's the magic of randomization. It's usually, most commonly, it's um, by just, by this randomization, it can deal with most of these um, confounding factors or these factors. If you do it again and again, you most, most of the time you will end up with somehow equal number of people in the two group even with these two factors somehow equally distributed in the two group. But for some reason, sometimes they do some kind, sometime, something called group rand block randomization. Um, and that's somehow to control these kind of things, especially for small sample size uh, RCTs. And the other, so the first, the first thing you have to check the methods about the randomization and allocation concealment. And the second step, if that's um, checked and everything is okay, then you have to check the baseline characteristic. Check if the randomization has occurred uh, properly or not by looking at the first table, usually in table one of the randomized control trial, there is the characteristic of those who has been randomized to the intervention group and those randomized to the treatment to the control group to check if there is any differences between the two group and if these differences are clinically important, especially you are looking at any clinically important differences that could affect the uh, bias, uh, could affect the results and bias the results. Yeah. So if I ask, what do you think if? Um, the randomization process occurred according to the calendar. So anyone coming to the um, to the weekends will be uh, randomized to the intervention group. Anyone coming to the um, weekdays randomized to the uh, control group. What do you think? Is that a good randomization process or not? Yeah, I agree with you. It's not a proper randomization process because it could be that people working in the um, weekends, like let's say more junior doctors or um, have a less experience specific interventions. And that's why it could lead to like worse outcome, for example. So there's somehow differences between um, that it's not a randomization. 
similar to the um, uh, randomization or allocation based on the department. So anyone coming to the, for example, emergency room, um, anyone allocated to department A will be receiving the treatment. Anyone allocated to department B will not get the treatment. So there's some kind of difference between the two departments and those differences in the skills and the experience could lead to the outcome. So could bias the results in a way. Nor patient who came in weekend, maybe. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's exactly. So we couldn't rely on these kind of thing, calendar, uh, as a proper randomization methods. Usually we are looking at uh, computer generated, generated random sequence, um, those kind of things, or even symbol. If that's if if, if the trial, um, like a symbol trial, in one single practice, uh, a symbol randomization like flipping the coin could be appropriate. I will be a little bit um, a little bit doubtful worried if I, I see um, in this um, a recent trial with a, a symbol as, such as like, like flipping the coin published, but I will look at table one and the characteristic. If they are like randomly allocated equal distribution of the characteristic, there is no significant differences. I will believe the results and I will say that this is a good randomization. So let's check the methods of the paper. Anyone um, could tell us where they could, where uh, if they find anything about the randomization um, and if that's uh, probably randomized or not. So in the article, that's um, the needle one. Can anyone check the randomization? Have they done that by the calendar or what kind of randomization that they have done? So number of opaque envelopes opened. Yeah, but how they actually done the randomization? Yeah, computer generated. Yep. So that's written under the intervention in page number uh, 1932 or in the PDF, the second page um, under the intervention in the third, fourth line. It says that um, infant were allocated to receive this or that according to a computer generated um, block randomization scheme. And they use the block randomization scheme here again and stresses stratification. So they stratif stratify the randomization based on the practices because there could be some of the practices have um, different uh, population. And that's why you could stratify the randomization based on one factor that you thought that this could bias the results. Okay. So do you think that's the methods of randomization are um, appropriate or not? So stratification, the, here, for example, they stratified based on the practices. So the randomization you, in this study, for example, done somehow within the practice. And this is to make sure that you're not end up with all the intervention those received the, for example, the large needle have been um, uh, allocated in one of the practices and those receive the short needle in the another practice. Sometimes you do that kind of stratification. So you do the randomization within the practice or take the practice as one of the factors to it within the computer generated sequence to, um, to make sure that the allocation of the participant between the group um, equally within each practice. We shouldn't trust the first one um, if there is, for example, they haven't written anything about the randomization, how they have done that, um, that's one thing. If they have done that based on the calendar, the department, um, or very simple method, and you check the second item, which is the baseline characteristic, and you find there is a significant differences between the two groups. At this stage, you will be very doubtful about uh, the randomization, and you will think again, 
that doesn't mean that you will discard the, the study and just drop it. You will be very cautious in the interpretation of, of the results. And also you will think about the direction of these bias. So in the baseline characteristic, whether that's most of the, uh, for example, the infants here, most, most of the infants that they are, let's say, um, uh, younger are allocated in one group and the older uh, infants allocated in another group, that could bias the results. And how it could bias the result? This is the question that you should ask yourself. And by looking at the baseline characteristic, usually you will see it as table one. And um, you can here look at the table one. You can see the, the weight, for example, somehow equal 6.7 uh, in one group, 6.8. Uh, the age of the vaccination, somehow very similar. Uh, the, the, this, this six, a little bit, the gender, male and female distribution, a little bit different. Um, sometimes they provide you the B value to check if that's statistically significant difference or not. And then you will think if that's a very important and critical factor or not. If the, for example, the gender, you thought that this is a very important and should be um, if there's any differences between the two group uh, should be accounted in the analysis, this is one of the points here that you could raise in your head while interpreting the results. Another thing, for example, the vaccine type, which vaccine that has been delivered, if there's a, a difference between the two group, the, the outcome or the results could be just because one group have received more of the vaccine that's more like Causing, could cause more allergy, allergic reaction than the other. But here, for example, both uh, the two group have an equal distribution of the uh, two different uh, vaccine types. Does that make sense about the randomization? Any question about the R of the RAMPL? Okay, what does block randomization mean? Block randomization means that um, usually block of four or block of six, the randomization occur on within that block. So you, you will assume that you have a block of, for example, six, and you will do the hidden tails that similar to what we did. And if the first one head, the second one head, the third one head, that's mean that the next three will, should be tail. That's the block randomization. And usually happened if you have a small sample size. So if your sample size, like for example, 30, for example, and you didn't up, end up with like all of the 30 or 20 of the 30 um, head or going to the treatment group on and only one going to the intervention, uh, to the control, you, can, you could do this block randomization. Every four, you will do the randomization. One, um, um, uh, one drawback of the block randomization is sometimes if a clinician know the first three, for example, and block of four, know the first three, in, a clinician knows that the first one went to the treatment, the second one treatment. Um, logically, the next two will be uh, a control, will be assigned to the control. So that could create some kind of bias and could break the blinding of the clinician. That's one of the drawback. But um, this could be justified if they have very small sample size uh, that they could be able to exploit. Okay, so we finished with the randomization. I would say this is somehow looking, um, there is no like red flag, like there is no major flag that I can see here. So that will be checked. The second one, loss to follow up. If there is a lot of people that have been lost to follow up during the, 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 the study or the duration of the study. And the rule of thumb, five and 20. Five percent probably lead to a little bit of bias. This is then five percent, perfect, good. Uh, five percent is okay. Between five and 20, acceptable. But more than 20 percent pose a serious threat to the validity of the results. And um, we should ask about ourselves why there is a lot of dropout in the study. Sometimes it could be acceptable, 
some kind of study, there's an anticipation, there's a lot, a high dropout rate in the study. For example, if they are doing a study um, addiction um, or um, some kind of prisoners related to prisoners, you could anticipate a, a high dropout in the study, more than 50%. And that's acceptable and justified. But if a study that uh, there's no justification to have a very high um, dropouts, should be within that range. That's one thing. The second thing, which is very important in the attrition and the loss to follow up, that's if there is any loss to follow up, should be equal between the two groups. So that you shouldn't have all the loss to follow up in one group, and there is no loss to follow up in another group. If there is any loss to follow up, should be equal between the two groups. And there's a good example for that uh, about the vitamin E for retinopathy of prematurity or retrolental fibroplasia. Um, so what happened those people um, having retinopathy of prematurity? Now we know that this is mostly because of the oxygen, uh, loss of oxygen to the babies. Um, and one of the study has found that early, very early study that vitamin E could be um, uh, effective in treating or preventing retinopathy of prematurity. And that's in the article shown, shown to be very effective. Those who have received the vitamin E are more likely to, um, to or less likely to have retinopathy of prematurity. But when they investigated that farther and farther, they found this is attributed to the fact that the nurse or the clinician when they would like to administer the vitamin E to the babies, they take the babies out of the incubator to give the vitamin E for a period of time and thus reduce the amount of oxygen delivered to the babies rather than the vitamin E itself. But for the control group, they don't take the babies out of the um, incubator and they have received the full amount of oxygen. So it's not because of the vitamin E, but because of the differential in the treatment they haven't treated the group equally. That's led to the bias. And that's important to make sure that all the group treated equally. Um, so for example, here in the local reaction, the vein, you shouldn't have the people that um, randomized to, for example, the larger needle, um, the infants given like sugar or something like that, that can reduce the pain they should be treated equally. So some study increased the sample size for each group from the beginning in case of attrition. Yeah, if there's an anticipation, high attrition or uh, sorry, higher loss to follow up, they, um, for example, if the sample size calculation, um, you calculate the sample size and you found that you need 200, but you anticipated that you'll, the loss to follow up rate will be about 30%, you will, um, um, recruit, for example, 300 as an anticipation. Increase the sample size, recruit and target sample size to accommodate this attrition. So is that ethical? So yeah, that's, that's why you should treat both group equally. You shouldn't have any uh, differential in your treatment between the two groups. So that's in the attrition. So the first thing in the attrition to check the loss to follow up the second one to check if there is anything apart from the intervention itself should be all equally between the two groups. All the groups should be received the same at attention, the medical care, anything apart from the intervention should be equal. And um, the last thing in the analysis, something called intention to treat analysis. So, any patient randomized to the group should be analyzed within that group, whether they have received the treatment, the assigned intervention or not, whether they have uh, discontinued, whether they have um, crossed over to the other treatment, they should be analyzed within that group. And that's very important. And let's demonstrate that in this, um, this exercise. So you have two very small sample size. <laughs> you have eight um, patients randomized 4-4 four, four to the control. Uh, that's no intervention and treatment. Uh, that's received, for example, a daily bill. And 
one of those that have been assigned and should receive the uh, daily um, medication actually haven't received the medication, haven't taken the medication at all, but developed the outcome. They say the outcome is the death, have died after a year. But actually they have this patient, this one in the red, haven't received the intervention, the, haven't um, taken the, the medication at all, but died after a year. In the control group, this uh, patient have taken nothing because assigned to the control group and died after a year. While the other three here in the control um, still alive after a year and this treatment in the treatment group, the three alive after a year. So if you would like to analyze this results, uh, per protocol, that means according to the protocol of the RC team. So what do you think is the, um, the outcome, the event rate in the control group? If we assume the outcome is being alive, the outcome is being alive after a year, what will be the percentage of the people that have um, per protocol? I can see 75%. What about the treatment? Better protocol. So here, it, because the protocol say there should be in the control, they shouldn't receive anything. So that's all of them have uh, adhered to that protocol. So three out of four um, still alive after two, one year, that means 75%. Where in the treatment group, because one of them that have had the outcome, haven't been ad adherent to the uh, protocol, haven't taken the medication, which is what the protocol um, proposes. So here we will, according to the pair protocol analysis, we will drop that from the uh, counting and we will just say three out of the three that have followed the protocol still alive, that's 100%. Yeah, so that's the pair protocol analysis. There's another analysis called as treatment, according to the treatment that received by each participant. So what do you think will be the control, the, um, the event rate in the control arm? Those who haven't received. How many people were still alive after a year from those who haven't received the medication? So isn't that three three out of the five, because you will calculate this one because hasn't received any medication. So according to the treatment, this will be counted to the control group. So three out of five, that's 60%, but here still three out of the three, because only those three have received the medication and all alive after a year. But what we are very interested in, and you should look at intention to treat analysis, Whenever or whatever this patient randomized to the which group, they should stick to that group and randomize accordingly. So that will be 75%, 75%. Whether that patient received, actually received the intervention or not. Why that's important? Because this patient could drop the medication because of a side effect. So they have a side effect and they drop a medication. And that outcome is just because of the side effect rather than the um, actually because of the disease. So intention to treat analysis is important to, to make sure you haven't uh, ruined the randomization and you maintain the randomization process. So if we looked to look at the, um, the first one, if you would like to check the loss of follow-up, usually they will have something called the consort flow chart, a flow chart um, documenting all the patients and how they flow through the participants. So for example, here, they started with 119 articles and randomized to 61 infant um, vaccine, vaccinated in 25G and 58 to the 23G. And after three days, 57 
completed the trial out of the 61 randomized to the 25G. And that means that only four out of the 61 um, lost a follow up. And if you'd like to calculate that, who can calculate the attrition rate in that arm? So four out of 61. Is it more than 5%, less than 5%? Yep, about 6.6%, .6%. yeah, exactly. And for the other group, um, somehow similar. So overall, it's about 5%, 7%, and somehow distributed equally between the two groups. There is no one group that has lots of loss to follow up, and that could raise some concern. This could be because of the intervention rather than the... Um, the natural or normal loss to follow up. Yep. So that's that's check. Okay. And uh, in the article itself, they have mentioned something related to the how they uh, gave the intervention. I think in the second page, they say that the practice nurse. Yeah, in the second page, in the second column, in the last section before the outcome. The practice nurses were instructed verbally by demonstration and how to they like instructed the practice nurse nurse about the technique how to administer the um, the vaccination and where to administer the vaccination and the end angle for administration all these kind of things to make sure that all the participants treated equally and that's should be check that one. And finally, the intention to treat analysis, if you can look at um, the table one, um, you can see if they have done that or not, or you can calculate by yourself. Even if they haven't done that, you can calculate the intention to treat analysis. And that's about the attrition. Finally, the measurements, I'm very aware that we have two minutes, but we can go a little bit further if you would like. For the measurements, you have to check um, the final finish, whether the outcome assessed were blinded or not. And the very important question, who were blinded? So you shouldn't be deceived by having a title or in the methods that uh, this are still um, blinded, but then they blinded someone who is not that important. So whether the participant were blinded or the investigator or who assessed the outcome or the statistician who analyzed the data, who, um, who are the groups that were blinded in the trial, that's very important. And most importantly that you have to check is those who assess the outcome, evaluated the outcome should be blinded. And those who administer the intervention should be blinded. It can be all for sure, yeah. But at least you have to make sure that the outcome evaluator should be blinded. So for example, um, and that's take us to the next question, whether that's uh, the outcome, whether that's an objective or subjective. Anyone could give me an example of an objective outcome? Mm, fever, you take it by a thermometer. That could be an objective, but could be an, a subjective uh, depending on who take the fever measurements, how they take the measurements, for how long, for example, they have stick the thermometers in between, I would say. Uh, lab results could be objective. Yeah, the lab results could be objective, but it depends also on the lab, but somehow objective. The, actually, the pain is on the other side, subjective, because it depends on the personality. So my perception of pain is could be completely different to another one subject to the pain. So that's that's a typical classical example of the subjective outcome of the pain. For objective, you could think of like for example the death. There's it's difficult to say uh, this person has died or not, or alive or not. Although it could be an IC IC doctors could um, argue with that this is a death or not, but generally it's speaking um death could be an example of an objective outcome or a good example for an objective art outcome um yep yeah. but for blinded for subjective outcome uh the pain is a good example for subjective outcome and let's go back to the blinding the pain usually assessed by the patient themselves 
And if in this instance, they have blinded the clinician who asked the patient, what's your pain score? That's not important if the patients know which intervention they received. So for a patient who have uh, received the treatment, they could have that placebo effect. They could think, they could like perceptionally uh, think their, uh, their pain has improved compared to those who have the control or received uh, no treatment. So that's very important to identify who is blinded in the trial and then whether the outcome is objective or not. Okay, in this trial, what do you think whether that's blinded? So for sure, the, the, the practitioners, the, those who in, administer the intervention were not blind because they, are, uh, they could identify the needle the patient, they haven't mentioned, I couldn't, I'm not sure if they have mentioned anything about the patient, whether the patient were blinded or not. They could be blinded. The parents, for example, could be blind because the parent, the outcome here, the parents recorded the outcome each day for a three days. So the parents could be blinded um, here. Um, if they were blinded, that would be great because they will record uh, the outcome. Okay. So what do you think overall? Can we trust the result of this study? And here you can, how you can somehow schematically um, using this, what's called um, gate critical appraisal developed by Rod Jackson from New Zealand. Uh, so you start with the participant intervention, how many assigned to the intervention out uh, the control, how many drop out, how many end up with the uh, this outcome, let's say the main outcome, any local reaction, and this is the relative risk, and this is the timing. I would say that there is no a very major red flag uh, in this article. Apart from that, they originally, um, in the calculation, the sample size calculation, uh, they, um, they calculate that they will need 250 infants, but end up only with 120, 119. So there could be the results of this study is not, um, the, the, the sample size is not enough to detect or to be able to detect differences, significant, statistically significant differences. So maybe I'll look at, at another trial if there's, um, to produce a more robust um, results or outcome. Yep, I would say maybe you need another trial or two trials using the same methodology with a larger sample or larger enough sample size or enough sample size because here they haven't achieved their sample size that they have uh, calculated. Yep. And also, it could be another good option for the generalizability. If you are, for example, working in Palestine, uh, the, there could be some kind of differences in the uh, population. So, so maybe you'll ask, I would like to, to look at maybe multinational study um, to see if that's, if the outcome also maintained within these multinational studies or not, according to different ethnic groups. Okay. I think we can finish here, sorry, four or five minutes late. Um, I just, I would like to double check that you all understand the relative risk and risk ratio and these kind of odds race, um, risk difference, these kind of effect measures, because these are very important for the interpretation of these results. Are you all aware of that? What's the difference, for example, between absolute risk, dif absolute risk and the relative risk or risk ratio, or how you can tell if if you um, if you were given this relative risk 0.74, and this is 95 confidence interval, if that's a significant result, statistically significant result or not. Anyone can tell if this is a statistically significant result or not. Yes, I'm not sure if if you would like. I have few slides. One is not included exactly. I have few slides on the relative risk and, and um, risk difference, but maybe I will stop 
here um, for question and um, I'm not sure if, if you would like to have these few slides, 10 minutes, we can go there. So if there's any question, please either ask on the chat, um, looking at the chat or um, unmute yourself and ask. Or if you have any comments or suggestion. So I think there's a question about the rule of peer reviewing if we need to reach science if you study. Uh, that's a very important. So the peer reviewing is important and try somehow improve the study. Um, although there is a lot of um, question about the role of peer reviewing and the importance of peer reviewing. And especially with the COVID-19, we can see a lot of preprints now, which is before the, all the peer reviewing studies published, like for example, in the mid archive. Um, but at the end, most of the studies, if someone would like to publish a study, they will publish the study, even if the study, the quality of a study, like rubbish, they could publish it. And the peer reviewing uh, and the journal, the editorial journal, couldn't prevent that from happening. Um, and that's why your role is very important. And at the end, even in very high impact journals, New, New England Journal of Medicine, PMJ, all those lancets, all of these journals could publish something that's not that high quality or the conclusion or the interpretation of the, um, the evidence or the results could be biased. And that's why you should critically read. I, I wouldn't say for every article that you are reading, you should critically read it or critically appraise it. But for those articles that you daily practice it, you should um, critically read it and critically appraise it. Yeah, we need that critical appraisal to make sure that the article of um, good quality that you could take the, the, the finding of this study to apply it to your patient exam. So I feel, I'm not sure. So would you like me to go to the, um, the effect size for 10 minutes? Yep, so let's go. So Usually if you have an association or effect and you would like to um, measure the difference between the two groups. So let's take an example. You have a two group, one group of non-smoker and one group of smokers. And the outcome that you are measuring the cardiovascular disease or coronary heart disease. And those in the non-smoker group, you have three out of this 12, you have 12 here in this group. Out of this 12, three uh, died, for example, uh, due to cardiovascular disease. And here you have six out of these 12 died out of the cardiovascular disease. How would you describe the effect or the escalation between smoking and death due to cardiovascular disease? Okay, I'll make it more optimal. How would you describe the number of people or the proportion of people that died due, due to cardiovascular disease in the non-smoker group? What's the proportion of people dying from cardiovascular disease in non-smoker group? Yep, three out of 12, which is exactly 25% or 0.25, exactly. So about one quarter of people, non-smoker, died due to cardiovascular disease. What about the smoker group? That's six out of 12. Exactly, that's 50%. Now, to compare between the two groups, and I think that there are a few questions that have been, uh, a few comments that they already compared between the two groups. To compare between the two groups, you have one of two options. I don't think there's, you could compare between two groups um, apart from these two options. You can either take the difference, which is called the risk difference, or sometimes called the absolute risk difference. Take the difference between the risk or the proportion of the outcome or the event rate between the two group. That's called the risk difference or the absolute risk difference. Or take the ratio, dividing the event rate in one group um, to the other. And that's called risk ratio. 
or sometimes called relative risk, which is the same thing. So for the risk difference, if you would like to take the risk in group one minus the risk in group two, so the risk in and those um, non-smoker group, the risk of death in the non-smoker group minus the risk of death in the smoker group, which gives us about um, uh, 25 percent. So that means smoker health had 25 additional deaths per 100 people compared to the non-smokers. Or you could flip it around. Non-smoker had um, 25 less deaths per 100 people compared to the smoker group or smokers. That's the risk difference. The risk ratio, you just take the ratio and that's 0.25 over 0.5 and that's 50 percent. That's mean the risk of death in the smoker group 50 percent more than um, the non-smoker group or take it could be you could flip the coins and make it 50 percent less than the smoker group. Does that make sense? Yeah minus yeah you could minus exactly minus 0.25 um, will be less or 0.25 will be more exactly can take it either positive or negative. And very important here is to express to the patient with both the absolute, in absolute terms and in relative term. And sometimes the absolute for the patient more important than the relative term. And that's one of the way that's especially the pharmaceutical um, representative trying to persuade clinicians to prescribe drugs. For example, if you have um, if you have a drug that can reduce the risk from one percent risk of death, for example, after a year, or risk, for example, of um, having a fever. Let's let's take let's say for example um, uh, a drug for acute pain, reduce the risk of having a pain after a week from 1% to 2%. If you would like to express that in risk ratio or relative risk or relative terms, that's a 50% reduction, isn't it? From 2% to 1%. 50% reduction, which is a huge reduction in the, um, in the pain and could persuade either a patient to take the medication or a clinician to suggest the medication to, the, uh, to their patients. But if you express that in absolute terms, that's just a 1% reduction. Make it a little bit, uh, make it a complete difference, whether that's a 50% reduction or actually it's 1% reduction. Only 1% out of 100 who take um, out of 100 who have um, the pain, if they take the medication, uh, one of those 100 will not have the pain. Yep, exactly. The, the number needed to treat is an absolute um, term, which is a very good, yeah. The number needed to treat or sometimes, uh, or the other, if, if you are talking about harm, the number needed to harm is very, which is the number needed to treat is just the one over the absolute risk difference. So one over the 0 0.25, which is, anyone would, can calculate this one? So one over 0 0.25, would it be four or is it four? So what could be the number, yeah. So four will be the number needed to treat. So, you need to treat four, sorry, the example couldn't be here because that's smoking, so it's not treatment. If we thought about that as, an, as a treatment, we need to treat four uh, to, to save one life, if that's a death, or to have the outcome in one uh, person. So the, so for the two, so the number need to treat is one over the risk difference or the absolute risk difference, not the risk ratio. We couldn't, because the number need to treat is an absolute term. Does that make sense? And then to make, to know, uh, so how could I know the number need to treat is just um, 
you you can calculate that if you have the risk difference or the absolute risk difference you you take the reciprocal of the risk difference one over the risk difference so one over 0.25 that's the number you need to treat yeah exactly one over the risk difference so to know if that um, a treatment is statistically significant or not you you need to know what could be the no difference uh, value when we could say that there is no difference between the two group what do you think if there is a difference and the two group are equal well what will be the no effect or null uh, value in the risk difference or absolute risk difference the zero because anything minus the same thing will be zero and what about the risk ratio will be one yep so if there is no difference between the two group the value of the risk difference will be zero and the value for the risk ratio will be one so if you if we are talking about this for example if, if this is um if this is a value for um a risk ratio what do you think is that um sig statistically significant or not it's the effect size risk ratio 5.2 and the 95 confidence level ranging from 2.1 to 6.7. Yeah, because it hasn't, if you're counting from it, the, the confidence interval doesn't cross the null value. And graphically, you can look at this like this. Um, so for example, which one of these are, um, of these confidence interval are statistically significant? A. A and C, exactly. And the difference between A and C, the A1, the A, is statistically significant. Um, the treatment is statistically significant causing the benefit, while C is statistically significant harming the benefit, harming the uh, patients. So it's A and C because both of them have, both of them are not crossing the line or the null value. And yeah, people could confuse that only this one because looking at only at the benefit. But if, if you look at this one, this is statistically significant causing the harm, the treatment causing the harm. So it's still statistically significant, but on the other, the opposite direction. Okay. I think... Um, I could stop here and if there's any question, I'm happy to answer. I hope that by this, you would be able to critically appraise an article. Oh, there is a question. Um, is there a perfect sample size for an RCT? Um, there is a rule of thumb. Um, yep, there is a rule of thumb. The rule of thumb that's according to the event rate, according to how common you would expect that you will have the outcome. And for each outcome um, in the group, you should have 50. So the, the rare event that you are examining, you need a very large sample size. The other question is, can you talk about the sample size calculation and the G power? I can talk, but I, I would I wouldn't think that's part of this um, critical appraisal, and there is some kind of um, calculator that you can just uh, know. What you need to know is um, what's the uh, hypothesis, what the expected or anticipated uh, effect size, or the difference between the two group, and then what you need then uh, is the usually the power sits at 80% and the 5%. And that's like some kind of the standard. Uh, apart from that, you just use the calculator and based on the sample size, oh, sorry, the study design, you will, can go through that and you will um, find the sample size. I can send the link for um, a calculator if you'd like. And I will just give you a link to one of the tools that we have developed with the Center for Evidence-Based Medicine. Uh, so that's all of these tools have been developed by um, 
uh, the Professor Bogazi that I'm working with when he was back in Oxford. So these are critical appraisal tool that have somehow the same heading. So looking at, you should look at the randomization, you should look at the attrition, you should look at the uh, blinding with a little bit of explanation on where you could find uh, these, um, uh, these uh, information. I think from the last lecture, some uh, general comments from the last lecture about how we could develop uh, these skills and keep uh, practicing these skills, one of the most important. And I would really um, would um, stress to do some kind of genre club. And in this genre club, you will critically appraise these kind of articles regularly with a group of people that's uh, having the same skills. Um, and I'm happy if there's any kind of an idea that you would like to uh, do a journal club. And nowadays they can be done in Twitter or online. I'm happy to, um, to hop on and every now and then and um, um, help in that. That'd be amazing. So there is, um, Oxfam normally does have a journal club. Um, we do it monthly. Um, mm, so that's great. Yeah, keep, yeah so um, everyone keep your eyes open for the emails about that. Um, we've taken this month off just in order to focus on setting up these lectures, um, but generally it's monthly. Um, so we probably will be emailing you, Lohai, about um, facilities. Oh, that's good. Um, but also if anyone, um, obviously students, you can set up your own journal clubs within your unis or whatever, but if you wanted like some help from us in setting up your own journal clubs, um, if there's any way that you can imagine that Oxpal can help you with that we'll also help you just do your own thing um so let us know mm. um, there's a question about the um, the language i'm happy to do either english or arabic but i uh, yeah I, uh, last time this was my first um um presentation and i thought that's the usual thing so but uh, i'm <laughs> not sure I, i'm i'm quite sure that most of the attendants are um Arabic speaking, but I think they, I would assume, I'm not sure, I couldn't speak um, on Oxbell, but I would assume that's part of that. They would like to increase the, maybe the language um, skills as well. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I think from Oxbell's um, point of view, like, obviously for some of our lectures where it's um, like English people, obviously it has to be in English. Um, yeah, well, we do have lecturers that could do either. Previously, when we've had lecturers speak in Arabic, we've had a fairly equal number of feedback saying they would people would rather it in English, and then we kind of get equal numbers of feedback saying one way or another. Um, so it's actually really up to the lecturer. Like if you do another lecture, you can do it in Arabic if you want. Um, but yeah, um, it's I guess we're almost in the habit. But if people would prefer it in Arabic, just put it in the feedback and we'll take that into account. So yeah. Okay. Mm. Cool, thank you. Okay. Thank you. So I think about the journal club there, there's um, my understanding now that there's a journal club running every month within the Oxbell and um, I'm happy um, uh, to do it as a structured journal club with, I'm not sure how the structure of the journal club within the Oxbell, but I'm happy um, to help and make it more a structured journal club. We are doing here uh, supporting uh, general practice within the uh, Australia, especially in the state of Queensland, to run a journal club, structured journal club, not only concentrating on the con clinical content, but also on the methodological content. So doing a lot of critical appraisal skills uh, within the clinical um, theme of that journal club. So somehow practicing these skills uh, within the journal club. Happy to uh, help in that as well. Yeah, that'd be good. It's the other, um, it's the other team member who tends to run that. So I'll, I'll put her in contact with you to, mm -hmm. uh, because it's kind of her area of um, yeah, babe. knowledge. Great. <laughs> Great. So, yeah, yeah, sure. Thank you for ever. Thank you to everyone who came. Um, thank you so much. And yeah, thank you again, Loai, for um, a really um, detailed and I think very clear and helpful lecture. Oh, and yeah. last, where can I find the club? The question in the chat. So the journal club is advertised the same as the lectures on the emails and on our Facebook and Twitter. So when it happens, probably next month, it will be, um, or maybe month after, it'll be put there. But yeah, 
Thank you so much, Lai, and thank you everyone for attending. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Bye. Bye.